Over the last few months, I've been building a huge RC car powered by a micro jet turbine. In this video, you'll see how I designed it, built it, and tested it out for the first time. This is the most powerful thing I've ever built, with a jet engine capable of propelling model aeroplanes to 300 miles an hour. I wanted to build a new car to improve on my previous design that reached a top speed of 118 miles an hour. The last car I put together was a bit of a proof of concept prototype. I took a small RC RC turbine made for jet powered RC planes and stuck it on top of a mostly stock RC car. There was a simple fuel system and fuel tank and also a simple inboard braking system with modified parts from the RC car manufacturer Armour who also made the chassis. I never intended for it to be much more than a learning platform but quickly this Whoa. little speed car was proving itself to be quite a serious bit of kit and this got me thinking. In the world of RC cars there's something called RC speed running which is where model cars compete to be the fastest in the world driving in a straight line. It's sort of like land speed record breaking but on a much smaller scale. The official speed record for a jet powered RC car stood at 93.2 miles an hour and I thought that I had a pretty good chance of beating that with my prototype jet car. I installed a new streamlined body shell and now this slapped together prototype was ready for a first day of high speed testing on a track. And immediately it seemed like the jet engine had an enormous amount of potential on this tiny, very small and streamlined car, accelerating away with the smallest of throttle impulses. The problem was harnessing this raw potential. With the high up centre of gravity and soft suspension, the car was quite difficult to drive. Despite this, I managed to get the car very close to that official record of 93.2 miles an hour, which was a very good feeling. I tried to notch the speed up to 100 miles an hour, but this ended up in disaster as I opened up the throttle much more aggressively, accelerating to 118 miles an hour before clipping the grass at the side of the track, which completely destroyed the car. My whole mentality is that the best way to learn is to push things until they break. And with this kind of project, unfortunately, breaking usually means some sort of spectacular crash. Of course, you seem to enjoy this kind of thing of crash, rebuild, crash again. So that's what I did next. <laughs> Thankfully, the engine somehow survived completely unscathed, so I set to work rebuilding the car for a test at a much wider track at a speedrunning event called Rossa in Wales, where people were running essentially the same car, an Armour Limitless, but without a big jet engine strapped to the top. This track being used was actually a huge runway, and I arrived with high hopes that the rebuilt car could easily smash the 100 mile an hour barrier this time out, and live to tell the tale. The idea was to go slowly at first and incrementally notch up the speed. But at 70 miles an hour I found the new system installed on the car during the rebuild, an electronic gyro, had other ideas about setting an official record, as being untuned it sent the car into a wild oscillation, overcorrecting itself. I managed to get the car under control but upon reaching the far end of the course I encountered another problem as the radio control signal cut out and the car drove itself into the grass. Despite setbacks, the version 1 car had definitely exceeded its original purpose. Pure thrust power seemed to offer enormous advantages over wheel driven cars, meaning that I was keen to push the concept to the next level through building a completely new car with one goal in mind, to go as fast as possible. The main problem with high speed RC cars is keeping them on the ground. As soon as any small bump or slight discrepancy in the running surface pitches the car slightly upwards, exposing the underside to the airstream, the car will become a very unstable aeroplane for a few seconds. Jet engines have a natural advantage over wheel driven cars here, as their thrust helps to keep the nose of the car planted on the ground. The other problem is harnessing the raw power of the jet engine with a stable enough car. Last time the engine had been too high up, which caused the car to wobble. This time I wanted to place it much lower in a longer chassis, which would also make the car more stable. I came up with a rough concept for a car that would be very long and very low, with a single intake on the nose. It was quite similar to the real land speed record car Thrust 2, which I travelled to go and see in the Coventry Transport Museum here in the UK. This land speed record car has an engine pushed forward
forwards in the nose, and large twin fins at the rear. This made it very stable, with the forward centre of gravity meaning that the fins could easily correct the car like the fins on an arrow. With a simple boxy fuselage and suspension parts taken from an RC car, I thought I could probably build something quite similar to this. Around this time I was speaking to Armour, who make the limitless chassis I'd based my previous jet car on, and very kindly they offered to provide me with a rolling chassis for the new car. But there was something else that I needed to design the car around, the engine. So would I use the old engine or look for something a little bit beefier? Up until now, the only microjet turbine I'd had access to was this small Swiwin 120B with around 12 kilograms of thrust. Although this would probably be sufficient, this engine hadn't been all that reliable in the past. As well, really, it would be an advantage to have more power than I really needed. So I asked around and found a company that was willing to help with the project. The JetCat have very kindly offered to send over two engines on loan for the project, so as long as I don't destroy them, um, I shouldn't have to pay anything for them, which they'd be way outside of the budget otherwise. So yeah, that's that's a massive help. Compared with the old engine, this JetCat 220 has almost twice as much thrust. So the power to weight ratio of the new car will be even better than the old car. JetCat had actually sent two engines, so I'd have one as a backup, just in case one refused to fire up on the day, because that would be quite annoying, wouldn't it? Now it was time to bring the CAD model to life. The chassis would be mainly made of aluminium, so I needed to get this machine somewhere. And this is where the sponsor of this week's video comes in, PCBWay, as they offered to cut all of the parts for this video as part of their CNC milling service. I used PCBWay's website to spec up the materials and finish for my parts before placing an order. And a couple of weeks later, I had all of the parts delivered to me in a big wooden box with plenty of protection. Yes, like a skateboard. These parts were very nicely cut and far nicer than anything I could have made by hand. PCB Way also offer other services such as PCB prototyping, 3D printing, CNC, sheet metal fabrication, injection moulding and OEM. If you'd like to get some PCB boards printed or some parts machined for your project then make sure to click the link in the description to go to PCB Way's website and yeah check them out. Now I needed to find a way to put all of these parts together. I decided to use threaded inserts pushed into 3D printed parts to securely bolt the flat aluminium pieces together. This was quite a quick process as I could print out parts on my 3D printer that matched up perfectly to the CAD model aluminium parts with fraction of a millimeter precision. I just needed to use a soldering iron to melt the inserts into the 3D printed parts, line everything up and then assemble it like a big Meccano kit. Next I could print out some more parts to connect the suspension assemblies to each end of the car. And then it was time to work on the braking system. So this is one thing that I'm carrying across from the previous car. The handbrake module that Armour makes is perfect for this application of slowing the car down using an inboard disc brake. So that's as opposed to an outboard disc brake on the wheels themselves, like on a normal car. This car is going to have an inboard disc brake which clamps onto the main drive shaft. So I'm gonna have one at the front of the car and one at the rear of the car. I've got a few problems to overcome. One, I need to make sure that the module fits underneath the tailpipe. And secondly, I need to make a hole in the bulkhead because I forgot to do that earlier. I made one on the front, but on the rear, completely forgot about it. Not like me to forget things. <laughs> That's sarcasm. Now it was time to make the chassis as strong as possible. I added some wire supports to transfer the loads from the suspension to the box structure of the car. And now I finally had a rolling chassis to start mounting the engine, fuel system and electronics to. The engine just needed to be set up with a temporary transmitter for the ground test. And then I could carefully solder the wiring together before fitting an engine to the car. Two fuel tanks were then plumbed together in tandem with lots of hardware for 6mm fuel tubes before being fixed to the floor of the chassis. With the help of some aluminium standoffs, the thrust tube could be fixed in place behind the engine. Of course, I still needed to finish the bodywork and the aerodynamic nose, but the car was now ready for some static testing. Okay, the time is finally here. We're going to see how powerful the car really is by firing up the jet engine for the very first time outside in the car park. We're going to tie it down using this rope so that it doesn't go anywhere, because <laughs> that would be bad. After adding my Patreon supporters' names to the side of the car, thank you very much to everyone who support me through my Patreon, I fueled it up with some help from my dad, who'd come to watch. What do you think? An accident waiting to happen. The plan was to do two tests, and the first test was a simple run up to idle. All right, let's go for power on. 
There we go. Revs climbing. <laughs> First run, success, fantastic. Oh, that is, that is a bit toasty back here. Sorry, tugging at the leash there. Now for the second test, a run up to full throttle. Let's hope that that rope holds. Right, I think it's time for the next step. So all of that seemed to be very successful and the only thing to be really concerned about is the motor mount melting slightly. So I think what I'm going to do is put some tin foil or some kind of aluminium foil around that and make it a little more heat resistant. Thankfully, there'll be a lot of airflow over the car when it's actually moving, so I'm not too concerned about this. The next stage of this project is to take this car to the track for the very first time and to do a sort of shakedown test with it. We're going to see how how far we get with all of this and sort of take it one step at a time. There are going to be loads of engineering challenges. We'll have to do tests with the aerodynamics and the wheels and making sure that the wheels can hold up to speeds over, you know, 16,000 RPMs, which is how fast they would be going at 200 miles an hour. If you're interested in all of this, then make sure to check out my website and the articles on there. Also, if you own a wind tunnel or, you know, you can make me some wheels which hold up to these insane RPMs or, you know, you want to get involved with this project, then send me an email or or something. I hope you're excited for the next video, but in the meantime, if you'd like to watch another one, here's one I think you might like if you got to the end of this particular video.